Hello, everyone. My name is Indal Levy, and today I'm going to talk about exceptions. So let's start. But first of all, I want to introduce myself. So I'm a C++ enthusiast. I'm also a soft, uh, an embedded software engineer at SolarEdge, and I'm working on smart home devices. I'm one of the organizers of Core CPP Conference and User Group, and a member of Work Group 21. In addition, I'm one of the founders of the Israeli National Body, uh, the ESO Israeli National Body, and I've studied physics. I also love math, so if anyone wants to talk about math later, you're most welcome. So let's start. I want to start with motivation to this talk. So uh, here you can see two surveys. The left one was made by ESO. The right one was made by me uh, in Twitter. Uh, uh, it was a Twitter survey uh, throughout our user group, uh, Course FP. You might have seen it. And the questions were asking, uh, the ESO one is actually more precise. It was asking how many developers can use uh, error, error um, exceptions freely in their project. And you can see that over 54% uh, said that they can't use exceptions freely in their project. And the right one is talking about uh, developers uh, working on embedded systems. And again, you can see similar numbers. So the problem of exceptions handling uh, being um, of projects avoiding exception handling is a, is a very large issue. And I, would, I know we're on a virtual uh, setup, but I wonder how many of you would say that you're not using exceptions in your, in your project. I would love to hear your answers later. Um, okay. So many industries, as I said, uh, don't use exceptions uh, for performance reasons. The error handling mechanism was addressed by a direction group, and this is a special group of uh, people that have been working on C++ for a very long time. It includes Viana and David and Michael Wong and others, and uh, they've addressed the error handling mechanism uh, by contract uh, in 2016 in, in a way that uh, they uh, addressed that uh, by addressing the predefined conditions. Uh, but contracts clearly are not part of our uh, of C20 yet. Uh, right. And they addressed it again in 2018. Uh, the exception mechanism was also addressed by Herb Sutter uh, in 2019 by the paper Zero, Zero Overhead Deterministic Exceptions, Throwing Values. And uh, again, in the recent meeting, uh, the last uh, uh, real-life meeting in Prague, uh, a paper by James Rodwick uh, and others were pre was presented. It's called uh, Low-Cost Deterministic C++ Exceptions for Embedded Systems. And uh, the last uh, two papers I'm going to uh, talk about uh, late, uh, uh, around the end of my talk, uh, the technical part. Uh, I also want to say that uh, I gave this talk in uh, Munich uh, user group, so um, I, I think it's it's very interesting uh, to see it. Uh, this topic comes out a lot lately, and I'm sure uh, you're most welcome to see um, uh, Klaus's talk, uh, where he talks about the uh, usage of exceptions. Here, I'm going to focus on the technical part. So, uh, as I said, I expect uh, a major changes in the mechanism in the near future. So, uh, the talk will go as follows. We're going to start with uh, what are exceptions, a uh, very basic syntax. Then we're going to go over history and domain. We're going to uh, look at exceptions overhead um, in the technical part again. And then we're going to uh, do a design overview and look at some alternatives. And at the end, we're going to talk about what's what's next in the exceptions um, mechanism. So uh, as I said, this is not a talk about best practices uh, of using uh, exceptions, uh, though it does refer very, very briefly to some guidelines. This is not a talk presenting uh, production level code. Uh, this is uh, the, the code that appears in the talk is just a POC, and it was ran only on Linux. 
And concurrency is also out of, uh, of the scope for this talk. And it aims to include a historical perspective, but I wasn't there, so uh, everything, all the decision-making uh, described is alleged. And hope you enjoy it. So, what are exceptions? Uh, exceptions are a fail handling mechanism. So here we have a function that's called foo, and foo can do stuff. And if ca in case foo fails, it can throw, it can either throw from, uh, of course, from uh, stood, uh, standard library uh, functionality uh, or uh, other things. And the error is propagated up the stack. So uh, just uh, as I mentioned, we're going to go very briefly of the, of the main uh, guidelines. You can define your exception type it's recommended to uh, derive from uh, std exceptions, and it is recommended to throw by value catch by ref uh, and rethrow just by using throw and not uh, the value. Uh, and this is just uh, uh, general guidelines for uh, optimizing performance in the, in the current uh, exception mechanism. So as I said, this is a fail handling mechanism. And as I've shown before, uh, uh, this is uh, the same foo that you saw in the previous slide. So we could try, put the try block on the foo and uh, the throws. And then we can have a catch that goes, um, that, that tries to catch a specific error type. Or we can just uh, uh, have a catch that uh, catch in a general, uh, general type. And here we can also re-delegate the responsibility for, error, for the error uh, by using throw. Um, okay, uh, so this is our main function and it have uh, the bar function that we saw in the previous slide and the bar contains the foo. And again, we can uh, catch the error uh, here, but we could also uh, re-delegate the responsibility and that, I'm, I mean, in quarter marks, of course, uh, but in a way, uh, when we decide not to catch the error, we're sort of uh, passing the responsibility to our operation system. So that's uh, a way of, of looking at uh, the exception mechanism uh, being uh, propagated outside of our program scope. So let's uh, go back a few years. So in the beginning, there were C. Then came C with classes. Actually, uh, uh, then came C++, but actually then came C++ with exceptions because I'm not, I'm not sure if you're aware, exception mechanism was something that was considered very early at the beginning of C++. And, um, and, and we're going to see in the following slides, uh, but clearly error handling was uh, a major thing. So let's go back a few years, as I said, uh, see the alternatives that were existed. They existed. So we have error codes that basically return value. And this is like the C style uh, error handling. So we have a function, it does something. If it fails, it can return a value that is not zero. And uh, usually that's a, um, uh, th that's, the uh, th that's the common uh, uh, way to do it. And uh, we have a function bar, and it checks the return value from foo, and it can return an error. And here we can do something, uh, this is the way to propagate up to the main, and here we can do something that regards uh, the failure of bar. And another way to approach errors uh, that was existed before C++ was using a global. It could be error no for system users, it could be error def uh, user-defined global, but the principle is the same. Uh, you do something, a failure in its the, the global, and uh, the, uh, the advantage of this method is that you don't really have to uh, manually propagate the, the error. You could just check uh, the error wherever, in whatever scope that interests you. So this is somewhat, um, I, I would say in some ways it could have been considered better, in some ways it's not. Uh, clearly globals have their own issues, but uh, just notice this, uh, this is an interesting um, difference. And um, uh, okay, and, and I just wanted uh, also to mention that, um, okay, wait, let's see, sorry. All right, so I just wanted to mention that uh, 
this is the common practice uh, also nowadays, not for C-Corp. So let's continue. So why exceptions? Uh, exceptions make it easier to adhere uh, to the best practices. They give error handling a more regular style. Makes error handling uh, code more readable and it makes error handling code more amenable to tools. So this is actually uh, a quote from the first uh, paper that suggested exceptions to C++ standard. And the design of the, of this, uh, of the mechanism of exceptions uh, took approximately five years. It finished in 1988, as I said, very early. Um, okay, so let's, uh, th this is a quote from Design and Evolution. So, in the original design of C++, exceptions were considered by pos but postponed because there wasn't enough time to do a thorough job for, of exploring the design and implementation issues and because of fears of the complex complexity uh, they might add to an implementation. In particular, it was understood that poor design could cause runtime overhead and significant increase in porting times. So, as I said, exceptions were considered very early. And uh, you can see here some responses to the original exception mechanism to the paper that we saw before. And you can see the responses were from a wide spectrum of companies. You can see here Microsoft and Ericsson and Apple, IBM, others as well that uh, Bian approached to. And th again, this was something that was debated very broadly. And I'll just mention here that some voices have claimed that exception may lead to bad quality program in a very early stage of, of this design. And we might, we'll go back to that later and, and think where did it came from. But nevertheless, exception mechanism was accepted to the first standard of C++. And here you can see uh, the section uh, regards that. So the following assumptions were made regarding exception usage. In, in this early design. Uh, and this is again from the paper uh, of, of defining uh, the design of exceptions. So exceptions are uh, used primarily for error handling. Exception handlers are rare compared to function definitions. Exceptions occur uh, infrequently compared to function calls and exceptions are language level concept. So we're gonna go over those assumptions and see uh, how do they suit, how do they fit to the current uh, version of exceptions that we have today. So original design, exceptions are used primarily for error handling. Uh, so it's true that a control flow management is discouraged by the formal uh, standard um, publications. And the existing practice really uh, rarely use uh, exceptions for control flow management, but do notice that um, C++ does not return to the, to the throwing code. So it's a design decision that were made again very early. Uh, it goes back uh, to the catch block. Exception handlers are rare compared to function definition. So it's true that the formal usage recommendation say that exceptions are costly and uh, clearly uh, you don't want to use them in a, in a time sensitive, um, in real time code. If thrown, we have reached to a point where uh, cost is the list of our problems. So they are used in, in uh, code bases that are not sensitive to that. Exceptions occur infrequently compared to function calls. That's also true, uh, standard library, uh, though standard library uh, does use exceptions extensively. So, uh, and this is one of the main issues that we have today. And it is common, though it's common to use uh, alternative error handling uh, because of this, uh, because of this, and also to avoid using the standard library. And exceptions are language level concept, that's true. Uh, they are platform independent and uh, uh, the ABI is defined uh, 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 to, to C++, but uh, a general concept is, is really something uh, across different uh, compilation, uh, sorry, uh, development languages. Uh, I also want to mention that other languages do have best practices of uh, managing control flow for the exception mechanism. I had a talk about it yesterday um, with some 
um, very nice people. So, um, exception overhead. So, the main difference between C and C++ is the cleanup process is now part of the language in constructors and destructors, clearly. So, but by using set jump and long jump, we break the contract between the user and the language. So, clearly, we can't use uh, set jump and long jump just like in C++. Uh, I will also just mention uh, two more terms. A happy path is the default scenario with no exceptions thrown, and a sad path is the path which uh, includes error. And I just uh, want to mention here as well that MSFC supports uh, different behavior for the jump uh, functions, uh, but we're not going to focus uh, here in the stack, we're going to focus on uh, GCC uh, particularly, but there are other things uh, exist as well. So uh, just a few words about happy path. And this slide I've added after uh, giving this talk, uh, again, as I said, in a Munich uh, user group, because I had a question about it. So um, I don't want to focus on, uh, in this talk, I don't want to focus on comparing uh, happy path to sad path. Uh, it's clear, uh, I, we will see a short benchmark, benchmark later, but it's clear that it's costly. Uh, but I just want to, uh, I just want to point out the, the, overhead that we do get on the happy path. So uh, for return values, of course, we have um, uh, the, the fact that the return, uh, the error is occupying the return value. So now we can't use it freely. And it adds the need to manually propagate the error, as we saw before. And it adds an if statement, which uh, eventually translates into instructions. Uh, by using globals, uh, clearly, uh, as I said, the multi threading is out of, outside of the scope for this talk, but clearly it uh, adds, um, uh, it, it's a problem in a multi-threaded uh, multi uh, environment, and it's limited. Uh, you have to manage the global in a way. And exceptions uh, have other uh, overhead that is uh, for the happy path. So first of all, when you do compile with exceptions, you need RTTI information. And there's also catch tables uh, created and uh, as additional assembly that is called the landing pod and is um, actually uh, created in a different location than the regular uh, control flow uh, to have, in order to avoid, uh, to avoid uh, getting cold uh, code into, into our RAM. So basically, uh, there's the hat path and, uh, and the hat code that is on the cache. And if there's exception, then we'll jump to a cold, a cold code. And of course, there's the runtime overhead that uh, just uh, loading cold code from memory in case there are thrown. But again, this is uh, just to understand what happens there. So let's go deeper into the set path. So now we're focusing on the set path of the case of throwing errors. Um, for an exception, of course, sorry. And I've compared uh, the throwing, uh, throwing uh, mechanism to return value code, uh, return code value. And just to make sure that we are on the same page, um, we're, I'm using here a throw by value catch by reference, of course. So this is the mini benchmark. And you can see here that uh, exceptions are uh, 435 times slower than uh, the return value. And the size, uh, I've tested this on X, x86 and on ARM, and the size is uh, more noticeably uh, larger here on ARM. But yeah, you can see uh, that there, there is overhead. Again, this is a set path. And there's a clear, clear observation of the overhead, sorry. And as I said, they perform worse on ARM. So, Two main uh, implementations for exceptions exist. The first one is table-based, which is what GCC and Clang uh, are using, and it's better for happy path results. And the second one is frame-based, uh, which is also called a uh, code approach. <clears throat> Sorry. And MSVC uh, uses that, but this is better for set path results. I have focused on GCC, uh, both because this is a platform I'm mainly working with, but also, I mean, on Linux uh, and GCC, but also uh, because I think it makes more sense, uh, the assumption for uh, optimizing better um, happy path uh, makes more sense to me. So uh, table-based implementation, as I said, have uh, 
some overhead in the program. I've mentioned it before, uh, but this is um, now referring to the to the to the case that we're using uh, the set path. So again, our TTI will be generated, and this is for both cases, of course. Uh, exception handlers will be defined, and each catching function will contain additional information of the catchable objects. And and this time, we're actually going to use this code uh, when throwing. So the functionality is uh, basically implemented in two main libraries. Uh, again, on GCC. So we have libgcc, which is containing, uh, which contains the functionality of stack unwinding, and frame management. And we have uh, libstud C++ contains the functionality of exception handling. Uh, it, this one uh, is um, aligned to Itanium uh, uh, CXX, and there's also a Itanium document regarding this functionality, but it is language independent. And here. I've added uh, just the list of the functions that are part of the ha of handling uh, the exception mechanism, so that you can um, you don't have to read all the names, but you can uh, definitely see that there's a lot of them. Uh, by the way, I haven't mentioned that I'll take uh, questions at the end because this is a uh, quite a long talk. I'll uh, be happy to be at the table and get your questions later. So the stages of exception raising pro progress. So, uh, sorry, process. So first of all, we allocate the exception. And this is a call for uh, uh, SC, uh, allocate exception uh, function. Then uh, we throw. That means that uh, th there's a call to throw. And the lookup phase starts. And then uh, in, in case uh, the there's some uh, catch uh, statement that deals with this type of error, then uh, we can also get to the cleanup phase. And I'll explain again uh, a bit later. Uh, just notice that in case of a failure, there's an emergency, uh, emergency um, space located, and you could, uh, and the exception will be allocated only in certain conditions. Uh, so for example, uh, it could be only uh, under one kilobyte, it can only have up to four um, exceptions in a single thread. And other uh, conditions that relate to multi-threaded envir environment, as I said, I'm not going to go deeper into that. So this is just in case that we failed in allocating the exception. Exception in general uh, can be allocated in whatever size that we want. So let's go deeper into those uh, phases that I've mentioned. So the lookup phase uh, triggers start unwinding a call uh, for this function called uh, raise exception, and it passes the flag uh, search phase. So in uh, we, we're going over the stack, and we're basically looking for a function that catch the uh, type of an error that we've thrown. And in case of a failure, uh, there's instant call for terminate, for std terminate. Clearly, there's no uh, cleaning of uh, resources. And in case of success, we return uh, uh, handler found. And uh, in that point, we're going back down uh, the stack, and then we start the cleanup phase, which triggers uh, the same function with a different flag called cleanup phase. So, um, Okay, so the cleaning progress uh, process uh, is as follows. The person personality routine uh, cleaning the stack frame takes over. So uh, basically, we have reached to a certain stack frame and we're cleaning it. Then we continue by, by calling unwind resume. Uh, when we reach to a stack frame that actually contains the catch statement uh, it suits the, the certain type, then uh, we begin we call begin catch and and catch begin catch basically treats the exception modify relevant data is sort of a global data that uh, counts the number of exceptions that are currently active and it uh, decreases uh, the number of exceptions and uh, then uh, it can uh, sorry uh, and catch can call to terminate or rethrow according to success or failure of the process. Uh, if, for example, we needed to do something in the catch and we failed, then we'll terminate. And if rethrow is uh, is called, then we just continue continue unwinding the stack. So, 
to go over this process with uh, with drawings and to make everything a bit more clear, let's do that uh, that uh, overview. So the complete progress is as follows. We have a subroutine, and uh, this is the nested subroutine, a subroutine on top and the one on top that we just saw before. For In this example, it could be the bar, foo, and main. So first, we allocate the exception. Then, uh, in case of a failure, in case we couldn't allocate, now we just call std terminate. In case of success, uh, we throw, which means uh, we start the lookup phase, and the lookup phase is go, goes by the uh, up the stack and looking for our uh, appropriate uh, function. And in case of a failure, again, we terminate. In case of success, we start the cleanup phase. So we go back down and we start the cleanup phase and uh, we do the stack unwinding. We look for the proper catch and we uh, call the uh, cleanup um, methods for each uh, stack frame that we are closing. And in case we found a catch, then uh, the, uh, we transform here and then uh, we zoom execution on the catch frame. And if a finally block exists, we also execute it and then we resume uh, in the catch block. So uh, let's have another design overview, but this time let's look at the details of uh, what are the things that we've uh, we've defined uh, that we want in the in the exception mechanism. So these are the assumptions from the original uh, design of uh, from embedded perspective of the exception mechanism. So we want a type safe transmission, and that's clear. We want no added cost uh, unless we throw an exception that's uh, close to what we have today uh, if you put aside the size and the RTTI uh, generation. Uh, handlers can be written uh, to catch a group of exceptions. So um, again, I'm coming from the embedded world, and uh, I'm looking for assumptions that could be costy. So I think this one might. Uh, we want to allow cooperation with other languages, especially with C, that actually makes sense, and I wouldn't think that we should uh, avoid that, but that's something that is part of our mechanism. Uh, exception occur infrequently compared to function calls, so that's also uh, great, and I, uh, actually I'll show later that uh, the majority of the community is uh, going forward having even less exceptions. Uh, type safe transmission uh, of arbitrary and narrative information. So when I look at this demand, I figure, I thought uh, that this might be a bit, uh, a lot to ask. So we could also uh, consider a design that doesn't have this requirement. And exceptions are primarily uh, for error handling uh, and not uh, code management. So again, uh, this is, these are uh, the assumptions. Um, I would I would think that this is a good assumption, but actually I had some talks during this conference uh, with people, and uh, they convinced me that this this could be um, considered. So again, uh, I'm not uh, suggesting a specific thing here. I'm just saying that we should really uh, look look into those assumptions and and consider, reconsider them maybe. So um, okay. So let's take, a, let's take a step back and see uh, how the exception mechanism is um, relating to our uh, general um, to our general system. So there's a subroutine, and again, as I said, there's a subroutine on top of it and the program. And again, if we're an embedded system, occasionally we have an OS operation system, and of course, there's the platform. But I think some things have changed since we first uh, described the error handling mechanism. So even if I do address embedded systems, a lot of embedded systems today do have some connection to the cloud, to the web. And in addition, uh, they usually, again, this is very dependent and embedded is a very broad uh, spectrum. But uh, occasionally they do have the ability to run more than one program on the platform. And of course, it could have been that on the site, there's additional platforms uh, that are coupled in a way with the platform, either by, uh, for uh, uh, reasons of uh, uh, to avoid uh, crashing or other things, but there could be that the more than one in the site. 
So I want to uh, I want to have a, another quote from Design and Evolution. I think it's a very interesting one because it really uh, summarizes what I feel about exception handling mechanism and error handling in general. So no single unit of a system can recover from every error that might have happened to it. And every, uh, sorry, and every bit of violence that might have done to it from the outside. In extreme cases, power will fail or memory location will change its value uh, for no apparent reason. So we really, uh, I think this, this quote really, uh, really puts the uh, spot on the fact that we're addressing error handling as part of a bigger system. So there are roughly three and a half types of errors. Um, and I mentioned before uh, that the whole community is moving toward um, having less errors, uh, sorry, less exceptions in the code. So uh, the first uh, type of an error is a program bug, which might resemble uh, for our today's exception as a logic error. Uh, the, the second one is a recoverable error. And the third one is a terminal error. So uh, things like overflow, et cetera. Uh, these contain errors which invalidate the program, for example, stack uh, corruption, and errors which uh, exhaust resources. Both of them are uh, types of errors that we can't uh, come up, uh, come back from. So uh, as I said, it's uh, uh, in recent years, it's have been uh, suggested to decrease the number of uh, exceptions that we throw in our program. And basically to just focus of throwing the third type of error because the program bugs are things that we would like to uh, identify in the early stage of development and before the code moves to production. And the second ones are uh, things that, I mean, we don't want to uh, do too much of a logic to handle with those uh, with errors, or at least uh, that's that's the design that I see in front of me. And the the third one is the the, the one that really uh, suggests throwing uh, exceptions. So uh, this was uh, the design section. Now we're going to move to alternatives. So some techniques uh, for exception mechanism uh, can. Certain techniques can be used to improve your exception uh, mechanism uh, in case you're working on embedded software. And I think, uh, first of all, I want to disclaimer, uh, I want to I wanna say that uh, not all of those techniques are suitable for every uh, project, for every company. Uh, it depends on, on the trade-offs that you're willing to do. But these are things that you could maybe consider. So first of all, you could use the current mechanism uh, and library uh, facilities uh, to optimize. So as we saw before, the RTTI information is generated and it could be that if we move to just a single type of exception, we might reduce the uh, amount of RTTI. Uh, the second thing we can do is override function calls to libs to C++. Again, this is a POC. This is not how we'll do it uh, uh, in a production code, but this is just the general notion of doing uh, of doing the the work ourselves. Uh, the third thing we could basically re-implement parts of libstud C++ and compile, add it to our project. And four, we could use some alternative mechanism. For example, MSVC have uh, the structured exception handling uh, mechanism that is not by uh, C++ standard uh, exception handling mechanism, though it is used uh, to implement the, sec the second. Uh, but, uh, but again, we could have considered, if we were on uh, a Windows platform, if we were using MSVC, uh, uh, in general, we could uh, decide that we wanna uh, change uh, from C++ standard to different um, implementations. So I've tried one and two uh, just to see uh, um, the effect and measure uh, because I always love to see uh, how uh, how uh, things that are um, uh, how things are in in real life and not just in theory. So let's look at the previous case. So I moved from throwing a few types of exception 
to a single type, as I said before, uh, aiming to minimize the RCTI uh, information. And um, so, so here we can see our uh, single type uh, uh, throwing an exception versus the return code. So first of all, you can see that the ratio is much bigger because um, this, this emphasizes that just by adding exceptions to our code, we have the overhead, as uh, suggested before, of RII, and the fact that this ratio is uh, is bigger says uh, that it just um, emphasizes that the addition alone, it doesn't matter how many types of errors do we add, uh, creates the overhead. Sorry. And you can see on ARM uh, similar uh, ratio, though uh, smaller, and just to compare uh, between uh, throwing three types and throwing one type, so here I uh, I compared them, and I got some gain on runtime, uh, mostly on ARM, but not something that is very significant, uh, at least in my opinion. Uh, again, this is a benchmarking on not on real life code, uh, but on my uh, tests and uh, experiments. And you are most welcome to go and try and see how uh, these things uh, act in your code. I will say that there are, uh, again, I, I wasn't aiming for a, a full benchmark, but there are uh, two very interesting papers by Ben Craig, uh, is also in the community. Uh, committee of uh, C++. He benchmarked both the size and uh, uh, of the size overhead and the runtime overhead uh, for different platforms, and I link to them at the end. So you're also very welcome to go and check those. So then I've moved to the second uh, to the second option, and I've tried to re-implement the uh, behavior of the exception. So. Uh, let's go over this code. So this is uh, really, again, this is just a POC. And here we can see our main function. And this function calls uh, some function that throws. Now, the throwing function is defined here, and it throws an exception. And it includes, uh, this is the uh, definition of the exception, of, and it includes uh, the library. And the library, uh, what it does is basically re-implements the allocate exception and the throw. So what I did here is uh, it re-implemented allocate exception by returning some kind of a global buffer, which is uh, addresses the uh, dynamic allocation overhead. And the second thing I did was, and again, this is not a real solution, it's just a POC to see our abilities. So I just terminated, or basically I exited uh, properly uh, when in, instead of uh, propagating up the stack. So this is really, uh, this really, this code really does nothing. But uh, you can see that um, here you can see the size of the of the uh, buffer that I returned, and the call for uh, the the call for constructing the exception, and we just exit. So the this thin uh, implementation that I've just showed, uh, you can see here that it have a ratio that is very similar to the ratio of um, of return code uh, versus uh, throw. So this is the thinnest uh, throw that you just saw. This is throwing one type of exception. And you can see, just for comparison, this is how uh, comparing uh, throwing or three values to uh, return value. So you can see these are very similar numbers. So that means that if you move from uh, throw to uh, thinner throw or re-implementing these parts, we could actually achieve something that is very similar in behavior to Runtime. Of course, the size is still big because uh, we still need to save uh, the tables, uh, the stuck and winding uh, tables, etc., and the handlers uh, of the exceptions. But I still think it's very interesting uh, findings. Okay, so um, I I want to show here what I think that could have been uh, some kind of a uh, ideal throw mechanism that we're gonna that I would have liked to have in the following years in our in the language in C++. So uh, you can have here you can see here a function 
And in case the function fails, uh, it can throw. But I would love to have some way to uh, customize this throw and uh, decide whether I want to unwind or whether I want to allocate. Uh, I think uh, other people have also mentioned similar ideas. Uh, but I think it's really, it's really important to identify um, uh, that, that we are doing, we're making decisions here that aren't necessarily suitable for all platforms. And here what I'm doing is basically uh, the subroutine is telling the program how it wants to act in case of a throw. There's another way uh, to do it, and this is by uh, just um, another design uh, um, um, concept to do it. It's not, it's not a technical way is just uh, so we could define in the beginning of the program or in the uh, executable uh, the way that we want to address throw. In this way, the program can actually sort of uh, impose its, um, uh, impose the, the uh, way that it acts on all the subroutines of the program. So let's look at the alternatives that I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the papers by Herb uh, and uh, low cost. And I, I want to show you the technical det details of those papers. So Herb's, as I said, uh, zero overhead deterministic exception uh, throwing values paper is uh, doing those um, having those design decisions. The first one is, um, First of all, it uh, it mentions it's it identifies that uh, the dynamic exception mechanism is uh, have a large overhead, and uh, program bugs uh, shouldn't be uh, addressed by exceptions. So, as I mentioned before, the general uh, direction of this paper is to first of all uh, um, educate the community uh, to use exception mechanism only for the purpose that we've seen actually in the original design for uh, identifying exceptions. And, and as I mentioned before, uh, decrease the number of exceptions in our code and avoid using them for things that aren't um, necessarily uh, suitable for exceptions. And also he addresses uh, the fact that allocation failure is not a regular exception because allocation failure, as I mentioned before, is something that it, the program could not uh, come back from in a way. So uh, again, he says that uh, he should, we should define errors uh, only as recoverable errors uh, that, we can, that we can address uh, later and replace those errors with uh, things like status codes, uh, stood expected, and I will mention it a bit uh, in, uh, soon, and uh, Deprecate, basically suggests deprecate logic error uh, from the reason that I've mentioned before. Uh, logic error is something that we need to address in, in the development of the progress and not later. So uh, the technical part of what he does is basically he's using a statically typed uh, error so that we'll avoid the RTTI um, overhead. He also uh, addresses the um, the uh, size of, of the code, uh, sorry, size of the error, and he returns it on the stack, so it's not dynamic allocation anymore. And the third thing he does is basically uh, suggest returning something that is uh, union style um, from the program. The union thing can hold both success or uh, an error, and a Boolean that basically tells us which, which one is it. And the this mechanism is not, uh, it's not the return, the classic return value mechanism that we're familiar with because it contains more, as you can see, but it uh, somewhat uh, uses the, the same principles uh, in the fact that the stack is the thing that uh, holds the uh, error uh, back. But I just want to emphasize here that uh, it doesn't mean that the uh, developer will implement this union by himself. This is something the compiler would do behind the stage. And uh, as I said, um, uh, stood allocator, uh, it can, um, uh, sorry, um, 
can be predefined uh, to define sort of the whole program, uh, the, the behavior for all the program. So this is something that what I addressed in the previous slide, um, but um, but just in in a, in a one direction. So the program defines the mechanism for the subroutines, and um, and and. And in general, he allows the programmer to decide uh, which error mechanism he wants. So the second paper that I've mentioned is uh, low-cost deterministic C++ exceptions. And the proposal focuses on minimizing the cost, uh, again, in technical perspective. So first of all, uh, it reduces the data needed for stack unwinding. It replaces uh, allocated exception with uh, 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 values uh, returned on the stack. Uh, again, uh, they're defined differently, of course, than what we have today. And uh, they're using global uh, to rethrow because uh, the rethrow mechanism is also uh, quite complex. I haven't uh, got into that uh, here. But uh, when rethrowing, we have to sort of um, change our context switch, uh, do some progress, and then go we'll back and rethrow. So these both proposals are, I think, they're very interesting. Um, I think, they're, as I said, they're, uh, they're addressing the problems that we have today for the exception mechanism, and I believe that they're going to. I believe that they're going to have a major influence on the way that the exception mechanism is uh, exists today. So, to conclude, I want to say that uh, you can create your own alternative. So, if in case you're an embedded uh, uh, performance, uh, um, uh, an embedded system that uh, needs uh, high performance, you could uh, do all sort of design decisions that are similar to the POC that I've just shown. Uh, of course, with the uh, with the trade-offs needed, uh, the fact that like uh, developing this mechanism will cost uh, developers time, etc. But you could you could decide that this is something that is important to you. And in this case, you can decide uh, avoid stack unwinding and replace with all sort of alternatives. For example, you can signal to a different progress process. Sorry, you could report to the cloud and send something and then uh, crash. Uh, for example, uh, I'm familiar with uh, with uh, Watchdog. It could be. Uh, a design uh, that includes watchdog that restarts your program. So you could decide that you just want to crash and then the watchdog will restart your program. You could uh, uh, use some kind of pre-allocated space, as I've shown, and you could uh, try to do other things like uh, just uh, minimizing the amount of, of uh, the different types of exceptions in your code. I believe it will it it could uh, it could uh, cause reduction in uh, overhead. So other suggestions uh, for error handling in general are exists. So as I mentioned at the beginning, contracts uh, are something that addresses uh, predefined conditions that uses predefined conditions to solve uh, to to avoid errors and in the early stage uh, before before they happen. And another interesting proposal is uh, stood expected, which uh, basically passes uh, the value that is expected. In case this uh, this is not what we get from our function, then there's uh, a callback, or we can do additional things to address that. And uh, just uh, another interesting thing that I think it's worth mentioning is that Ben Craig is collecting data for. Um, uh, for uh, generally data regarding the exception mechanism, things that I've just shown and uh, the, the general uh, um, known uh, common knowledge. So uh, this paper doesn't exist yet, but uh, it will in the future, I, I'm sure. And uh, there are also other holistic approaches in the committee. Uh, for example, um, there is a paper by uh, Bloomberg, um, by John Lacus and... Uh, res, uh, West Love, uh, defensive checking versus input validations. And I think this is a very interesting paper. I've uh, had a chance to view it in a somewhat late stage, but I think it's a very interesting paper. It uh, tries to identify the difference between uh, errors that we get on uh, production and errors that we get uh, on development. 
And uh, there's another interesting uh, notion by Stefan and Derek um, suggests that um, they're considering uh, uh, sort of adding flexibility to uh, to how do we define what is an error. And they're, they're suggesting to propagate error up and let the caller have some decisions uh, regarding that. And I've also uh, talked with Lisa, and she also have her own perspective on that. So there are really uh, different uh, people in the community that addresses that. And I'm sure we're gonna see some progress in the near future. So as, as I said, uh, we need separate, to separate the uh, semantics from the implementation. So uh, exceptions are uh, a semantical uh, definition or they're, uh, this, they're, they're a programming paradigm, but a development paradigm, but they're not uh, necessarily uh, coupled with the current implementation that we have today. And we also need to allow behavior suitable for performance sensitive applications. And I would uh, think that adding some customization to our current mechanism would be the right direction. And as I said, the overhead already exists. So just adding the customization is, is something that we can only gain from. So uh, in the last year, uh, the keynote was by uh, the previous uh, year for CPPCon. Uh, the, the keynote was by Bianna Sturpstrup uh, about uh, C++ Journey 30. So a lot have happened in computing in the last 30 years. And as I mentioned, over 50% of embedded or real-time uh, performance-sensitive systems can't use uh, exceptions. So I'm suggesting let's reconsider our environment, reconsider the decisions that were made because the today's embedded systems are not the same thing that was uh, 30 years ago. And we really want to consider the big picture. And I've added here, as you can see, um, a developer that is crass because uh, I, I, was, uh, I wanted to add here that uh, today our error collection is also done differently. And uh, it is rare uh, that on production code uh, on, on the systems, a uh, developer would go and uh, check the, the errors by himself. It usually be collected to a log or to the cloud. So I think that's also something that we, we want to consider the change of a paradigm. And I think today uh, the lack of observer uh, for those systems is something that is new. And I invite you all to share your ideal exception usage by emailing me. Uh, I invite you to experiment with the exception mechanism and suggest alternatives. Uh, as, as I mentioned, I think uh, major changes will be made and I would really love to see what do you, what do people uh, that are uh, part of the embedded community or, or others uh, feel that is necessarily in the embedded, um, in the exceptions uh, mechanism that they want to be able to use. And to conclude, um, exceptions, as I said, were designed around 30 years ago. And I really think that we should reconsider the design decisions and, uh, and let's rebase this mechanism. So those are the links that I've mentioned before. As you can see, there's a lot of them. I've uh, collected here some historical references. The technical references that I've mentioned are very interesting. Feel free to go and, and research every one of them. Uh, there's two talks uh, that define, that uh, address the unwinding mechanism that I haven't uh, got deeper into here today because it's also a very, uh, it's a complex mechanism and uh, I couldn't have put that in a, an hour. But there also the, the fact that people have done it before and I would uh, prefer not to repeat them. Uh, so this is a talk uh, talking about uh, unwinding uh, in Windows and this is unwinding uh, by uh, uh, Lib, um, uh, um, the, the similar way that Clang, uh, Clang is doing. And there's a lot of other interesting references references here. You're most welcome also to look at the benchmarking that I've mentioned. And uh, I would love to get your, your inputs. So I hope you're now inspired to go and explore your systems error handling and reconsider them. 
and feel really um, feel free to email me. I would love to hear your opinions about it. Thank you.